If you have a Bible today, I'd like to invite you to turn with me to Romans chapter 10 this morning. The book of Romans chapter 10, you'll find that in the New Testament right after the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, and then Romans, and we're in the 10th chapter. So, I don't know if you realize the vastness, the greatness of the day in which we are right now celebrating. Around the world, there are 2.2 billion people who profess to be some type of a Christian. They confess to have some sort of a belief in Jesus Christ. And today I want us, as we have done by song, to now, by word, consider the meaning of the resurrection. So let's start off for a minute. What is a resurrection? What exactly does this entail? Well, if we were going to define it real simple for everybody here today, we could define resurrection as the return of bodily life to a dead person. You die, you're alive again. But you're not just alive again, your body's alive again. Your being, your soul, as well as your body, come back. In fact, it was C.S. Lewis who made these very profound words. You are not a body. You are a soul. You have a body. And yet, when we think about resurrection, the idea here is not just that your soul continues on, but then your body comes back to life as well. Now, you need to understand something. 2,000 years ago, in Jesus' day, the idea of a resurrection was not culturally understandable or acceptable at all. Let's talk about the Jewish people for just a minute. Jesus was Jewish. He came from the tribe of Judah, the people of Israel, the line of David. In Judaism of Jesus' day, we know that the Jewish people had no concept of a personal bodily resurrection. They did believe in something that would be one day in the future, at the end of the world, a general bodily resurrection. In fact, it's talked about in the book of Daniel, chapter 12. It's talked about as well in Isaiah 26. This is what Isaiah says. One day your dead will live, their bodies will will rise, those who are dwelling in the dust, they will awake, and they will sing for joy. But you see, that was Judaism. No personal resurrection, but one day a general one for everybody at the end of the world. But Jesus lived predominantly in an era of Gentiles, of those who were not Jewish, who were not monotheistic. And in paganism, which we find our culture increasingly becoming, you have to understand that there is no concept of the resurrection at all. Death in ancient paganism was a one-way street. There was no afterlife in most philosophies of paganism. In fact, philosophers and writers thought that the return of life to the body of a dead person was not possible and it was surely not a desirable thing to have happen. In Greek thinking, the spiritual is good and the physical is bad. And so this view is represented by a man named Plato. I'm sure you've heard of him. Plato believed that the material things, including the earth, our human bodies, they're inherently evil, while immaterial things, such as the soul, is good. And so the goal of paganism is to get rid of the physical and to go into the spiritual. And the worst thing in Greek thinking and the thinking of Jesus' day was to have a physical body. They've considered the body the problem. The resurrected body was not a solution. So everything we're going to read and think and sing about Jesus today really went against everything that the people of Jesus' day understood to be true. In fact, one scholar, N.T. Wright, has said these words, Outside of Judaism, nobody believed in the resurrection. Nobody in the pagan world of Jesus' day and after claimed that someone had truly been dead and then claimed to be bodily and truly alive once more. This is unheard of. This happened zero times up until Jesus came into the earth. Now, with that understanding in mind, We jump forward from Jesus and his resurrection a little to the days of the Apostle Paul, one of Jesus' first great followers. In Acts chapter 17, Paul goes to the city of Athens. Athens would be a city much like the big cities of America today. It would be like Philadelphia or New York, so on and so forth. It was a a cultural melting pot. 
And he went and he spoke in Acts 17 in Athens at the Areopagus to the philosophers, to the worldview leaders of that day. And it's very interesting. As he spoke about Jesus, he came, he talked about the creation of the world, the death of Christ. When he starts talking about the resurrection, though, immediately we are told when they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered him. They mocked him. This idea that someone could die and come back to life was unbelievable. And today, people are scornful of the idea of the resurrection. In fact, they just about will come up with anything to not believe the idea that Jesus could have risen from the grave. So my question to you today, as we read these two verses, and then we pray and we talk about them for a few minutes, is how do you respond to the resurrection? What do you do with it? Do you believe it? What kind of a resurrection do you believe? Does it change anything? Does it mean anything for you? You need to understand today, if you do not get the resurrection, everything we have heard, everything we have sung, everything we have prayed today, well, let me read you what Paul says. 1 Corinthians 15, if Jesus is not raised, your faith is in vain. You are still in your sins. We have wasted the last 40 minutes. Look with me at Romans 10, 9, and 10, and let's consider together how we should respond to the resurrection. Romans 10, 9, and 10. The Bible says, If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Join me in prayer, please. God, we come to you today. We need your help. We need your strength. We need your power. We need the Holy Spirit to understand what your word says. Many of us never pause to even think about the idea of the resurrection of Jesus, much less our own. And so I pray today, Father, that you would work in our hearts. Lord, we just confess we have sinned against you this week. We have sinned positively. We have broken your laws. We have done things that you've told us not to do. And then, Lord, as well, we have sinned negatively. We have not done what we were supposed to do. We have strayed from you like lost sheep. And so today, I pray that you would speak to our hearts, that you would restore us. And God, that the power that made Jesus alive would make people alive today in this place. And we will celebrate as we leave here in a few minutes the living Christ. And we pray these things in Jesus' name and God's people said, amen. So let's just review. He is risen. He is risen all right, you're all awake. Now try to stay awake for the next few minutes, okay? That's the goal. Here we go. Ready? Two things mentioned in these two verses. Two important things that you got to get if you get the resurrection. Number one, the lordship of Jesus Christ. Number two, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Easter means nothing if you don't get lordship and you don't get resurrection. We could say it this way. Jesus is the door, and these two things would be like the hinges that hold the door together. If you get one hinge only mounted and the other's not, the door doesn't work, right? It doesn't open. It breaks. If you get the bottom one, same thing. It just falls right over. You have to have both hinges the lordship of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, for Jesus to make sense and for the door to be open to you today. I don't want you to waste your time here this morning. I want you to get it. So look with me, Romans 10, 9. Look at what it says here, the first door. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, it is impossible to overestimate the value of these three words in the English language. The Lord Jesus. Jesus. We say it all the time. We say good Lord all the time, usually not in the positive way, right? In the negative way. But I don't think we often understand what we mean when we say the word Lord. You see, in the Old Testament, we are told who the Lord is. In the beginning, right, God creates the heavens and the earth. He is the creator. He is the God that creates man. He is the God that does amazing miracles. He parts the Red Sea, so on and so forth. He is the Lord. In the Old Testament, he's represented as capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. What's very amazing when you get to the New Testament of the Bible, you will find out that Jesus gets the very same title that God had in the Old Testament. In fact, in the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament, six 
thousand times. The word here, Lord, that's used for Jesus is what is translated for God. So what I'm trying to say to you today is that, first off, you must affirm that the Jesus of the New Testament is the Yahweh, is the God, the creator, the parter of the Red Seas of the Old Testament. You are asserting he is God. In fact, 30 times in this very book of Romans, you will find that the word Lord is used. And very interesting, eight times it is used of God the Father. The rest of the times, it's used of Jesus. In other words, the word Lord is used interchangeably of the two. I don't know if you've ever thought through this before, but Jesus was not just a man. The Bible proclaims him as the God-man. In fact, we start off in the New Testament. I know it's not Christmas, but in Luke 2.11, we are told this pronouncement, Unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is who? Christ the, he's the Lord. He's the one who is the creator in the old. John, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God and this word, Jesus, was God. They are one in the same. Now this is also huge because Paul is writing to the Romans. And you've got to understand the, the word Lord in Paul's day. Because not only was it to the Jewish people spoken only for God the Father, the creator... But it was also to the Romans a very important word, to the Greek-speaking world. It was the word that was used for the emperor of Jesus' day. He was the kurios. He was the Lord. He was a god to that empire. And so the emperor of Jesus' day and Paul's day demanded supreme allegiance. He was to have the supreme place in life. He here as we read these words, was a man who is worshipped as God. In fact, if you want to think of a modern equivalent to this, you could think of North Korea and the dynasty of Kim Jong-il and his son. And you think about the way people worship those leaders as if they are gods on earth. That is how the Caesar of Paul's day was hailed. And so, my friends, to acknowledge him as Lord is to acknowledge him as having a right to rule over the soul. Like the emperor ruled over the empire of Rome, he is being called here the ruler of all, the one who has conquered enemies. You see, Jesus is not a hobby that you take up an hour a week on Sunday morning or twice a year during the big days of the Christian faith. Jesus is so much more than this. And yet we often trivialize him. Jesus is mentioned more often in our homes as a four-letter curse word than he often is as the true Lord and God, right? This is where we are today. So let's talk about this for just a minute. Caesar conquers the world. The emperor demands supreme allegiance from all his people. What does it mean for you to say you're a Christian, to acknowledge Jesus as Lord? Now, as a pastor and as a preacher... For me to start talking about the lordship of Jesus without first getting to the gospel is kind of crazy because it's kind of like telling a cat, hey, come here, I'm going to give you a bath. Is the cat going to come and jump in the water? It's about that exciting. So I recognize some of you today don't follow Jesus as Lord. That's okay. I understand where you're at. And you're going to hear these things and think it's crazy. But I want you to hear them because these are the demands of Christ. And then I'm going to give you the solution to hopefully make it, help you make it make sense. So what does it mean for someone who says Jesus is their Lord? It means, number one, that our minds belong to him. Our minds belong to him. Jesus said in the Gospels, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. In other words, there's a battle for the mind, right? The media wants a section of your mind. The education system wants a section of your mind. Political parties are vying for a section of your mind. I'm dreading the next series of elections. I don't know about you. Everyone wants a slice of what's up there. Everyone is trying and pulling for it. And Jesus says, I want you to learn from me. I've given you my word. God still speaks today to his children. He whispers to us and he guides us and he leads us. And if he is Lord, you have to give your mind to him. You have to think like he wants you to think and, and really be changed mentally by him. Secondly, if Christ is Lord, this means your ethics belong to him. 
It is not only what you believe about him that matters, but how you behave that matters before him. Because Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you do not the things that I say, right? He demands us, if we're going to call ourselves Christians, Christ followers, that not only should our minds be concerned in knowing him, but our actions, our behaviors should represent him. If a Roman citizen misrepresents the Roman emperor and he breaks the laws of the Roman emperor, there's a little bit of a problem, right? You don't believe that? Next time you see a Scambia's finest, just go 20 miles over the speed limit and hold your horn down and start text messaging as you're doing it and see how well that goes. They're going to hold you accountable, correct? And so this should affect us. Number three, our careers belong to him. If he is Lord, he is Lord of our time, our professions, our jobs, our ambitions. When Paul was saved and he met the living Jesus on the Damascus Road, one of the first things he says to Jesus is, what shall I do, Lord? Now, he had a pretty good job. He was a Pharisee. He was Pharisee of the Pharisees. He was paid to be a religious snob. And this is exactly the job Paul had. And in his unsaved state, not knowing Jesus as Lord, everything was great. And then when he meets the living Jesus and he follows him as Lord, his career changes. Lastly, everything we have belongs to him. Everything. You are not your own, Paul says. You have been bought with a price. So now you are following him. And I will say to you today, this demand of lordship is so strong. If he is not Lord of all, he is not Lord at all. Too many of us play the Christian faith. In fact, he is always called Lord. Go find Jesus in the New Testament where he is just called Savior. And then go find him where he is called Lord. And you'll be amazed at where the emphasis is. You see, this is the point. You can't be a Christian like Christ, a Christ follower, and then... Ignore everything that the Lord has to say. So that was crazy, I know, to tell you all that stuff. And some of you already have turned me off. You're not listening anymore. And the two of you that are still with me, thank you for paying attention. All right, so Kat, I'm going to take the water away for a minute. Now let's get back to resurrection for a minute, and then I'll bring it together, okay? He says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, but number two, if you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. If you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. Very quickly here, I need to say this. Just because only the resurrection is mentioned as what we need to believe in doesn't mean the other things don't matter. We should not hear this and say, well, the death, the the virgin birth, the sinless life, the miracles, the teaching don't matter. This is not like some reductionism. All you got to do is just say, I believe in the resurrection and then... Jesus is my Lord. This is not reductionism. You see, if you really believe the resurrection as the Bible teaches it, and you understand that Jesus is alive, his death, his life, his miracles, his teaching, all that makes sense. But until you get the resurrection, you really can't get the rest of it. This is the climax, the capstone of Jesus' life. So, if this is true, that Jesus came to this earth as God, he He is the Lord, and he lives the life that you and I cannot live, meaning we're sinners, we mess up all the time. He lives a perfect life without sin. He's tempted every way that you and I are tempted every day, yet he never falls, he never messes up, he never sins. And then he goes to the cross, and he dies, and he takes the punishment that we talked about on Friday, the punishment that you and I deserve for our sins. If all these things are true... And then we get here to the resurrection. Three days later, he rises again. What does this mean for us? What does this mean today? Well, number one, if Jesus rose from the grave, this means that Jesus came from God. So for God to raise Jesus from the dead is for God to say that Jesus has come from me. I sent him to this earth. You can believe every single thing he has said. It is trustworthy. These teachings are inerrant. They are infallible. They're not fables. They are fact, not fiction. God is putting his stamp of approval on the person of Jesus like he has never done anyone else in human history. Number two, if Jesus is alive, this means he died for sin. So sin and death and Satan are conquered at the resurrection. 
I don't know if you understand this, but this is a cosmic narrative. This is the biggest story in the world. No newspaper can contain this story. That from the beginning, there has been a war. There has been a battle. There has been a battle over souls that is waging. And it is a supernatural battle. And, and there is an enemy. His name is Satan. He is the devil. And he is doing everything in his power to keep you from finding the joy of Christ. To keep you from finding the hope of salvation in the Son of God. And some of you today, you're trying, trying Jesus out for the last time, you think. You've walked into these doors and if I don't get it today, I'm not coming back. Some of you have said that about six times before and you're back again. Today's number seven. And there's been this battle where Satan has tried. He started with Adam and Eve. He tempted Eve, and then Adam fell. And then Cain, the first son, sins against his father and his heavenly father and kills his brother Abel, probably under the influence of Satan. And then we just see the enemy attacking and attacking and attacking. Like many of you know, some of you right now are just realizing inside of you all of the turmoil and the struggles and the pain well, some of it was surely self-inflicted, but some of it came from an outside source. And you're realizing right now there has been an enemy. The Bible says he's like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And he's been coming after you. And if Jesus rose from the grave, this means he has made it possible for that enemy who's been doing everything to stop you from getting the gospel to be defeated once and for all. Number three, if this resurrection is true... This means that God accepted the work of Jesus. I mean, imagine, this was a, a terrible thing to the disciples. The one they had followed, they had put their lives, committed their lives to. He died. They expected him to live, not to die. And then he's buried in a tomb. I mean, these guys were so shaken by this. But by the whole, I mean, think about this. First off, Peter, these guys aren't very courageous anyhow. Peter, he's questioned about whether he even knows Jesus by a junior high girl. A slave girl, right? And he's a man, grown man, and he denies Jesus, that he ever even knew who Jesus was. And then after Jesus dies, the disciples aren't standing with Jesus. They're hiding in a room. They've got the door locked. They don't want anyone to find them. They're such cowards. you got to hear these words and understand that all of a sudden, on Saturday night at sundown, that the the breath of God kind of blew into that sepulcher, into that tomb. And at that moment, Jesus completed the work of God. And God said, I accept everything that Jesus lived for me. And I accept his death and the punishment for sins. And I'm raising him up to prove that now hell and the grave and the enemy are defeated forever. In fact, the Bible says repeatedly in Acts that God reversed the human court's verdict on Jesus completely vindicating him when God raised him from the grave. Number four, from his resurrection comes newness of life. You see, the fact is we're dead sinners. The Bible says that a lot of people read Ephesians 2. It says, and you he has made alive who were dead in their sins. And they read that and they say, yeah, and you who he has made alive who had the flu or who were very sick or who were on their deathbed or who were struggling with inner turmoil. They read all these things into that verse, but the Bible does not say that our sinful condition is just a struggle or it's just a sickness. It says we are dead in our sins. And if I don't know if you've gotten the figure yet, but dead men can only do one thing, and that is stink, right? That's all they can do. And yet, we read here that Jesus has been raised alive. And this affirms to us that just as he was dead and now he is alive, so he can change everything inside of us and make us alive. He can make our eyes finally see the world like we were supposed to, our ears hear the things of God like we were supposed to, take every sin, every guilt, every burden that's been holding you down dead in the grave, and he can break them away, roll the stone away, and you can breathe fresh air again as his child living and loved. My friends, we do not serve a dead, but rather a living Savior. This is one of the hinges of the door to get Jesus. Now, I want to take a minute and understand why we should believe this. Why should we believe that Jesus rose 
again, because this passage is calling us to confess and to believe this. Well, first off, I think we should believe this because of the empty tomb. Think about this. When famous people die, everyone goes and visits their what? Their grave. Everyone does this. Jesus is the only person whose grave they stopped visiting by the third day. He was buried in a tomb that was easy to find. I mean, he was poor in this world, and so he was given a secret disciple named Joseph of Arimathea, who was a very wealthy man. He was gifted his tomb, a tomb that had never been used before. Beautiful, brand new tomb. He was the first body laid into it. And most people would still be visiting his tomb after the third day. But Jesus is the only person that instead of visiting his tomb after the third day, they had lunch with him after the third day. I mean, think about this for a minute. His disciples clung to his feet. Mary clung to him. Thomas the doubter was able to take his hand if he wanted to. And behold, the nail prints of his hands and his side where the Spirit went into him. He was seen in 1 Corinthians by more than 500. He was seen by all the Marys. He was seen in the upper room without and with Thomas. He was seen on the road to Emmaus. He was seen by the Apostle Paul in 13 different locations by well over 550 people. And today, there are people sitting in this church who have seen him and they know he lives because he has changed them forever. Praise his name. Praise his name. Number two, we believe this because his family believed on him. His mothers and his brothers believed on him. You see, Jesus had two half-brothers, born of a virgin, Mary. And, and we know he at least had two, James and Jude. In fact, if you read the New Testament, you'll find out they eventually were used of God to write books in our Bible, James and Jude. Now, listen, I have a brother, one brother in this world. If I went to my brother one day and I declared to him that I was the sinless son of God, I am Yahweh, he would say, Josh, you're cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, right? You've lost it. He could give a million reasons just from the few years that I was in the house with him why I am not the sinless son of God, right? He might even have a scar or two to prove it. And then you read the Gospels and you see that Jesus' brothers and sisters, the Bible says they came to him. And when Jesus started teaching and saying he was God and doing miracles, they were like, Jesus, you overheated. You're, you're dehydrated. You need to come home and rest. You need to get off the street. You need to stop talking. Something's went wrong up there with you, Jesus. They did not believe that he was the sinless son of God. And yet, all of a sudden something changes, and they're the leaders in the first church. They're the leaders in the early church. What would make a brother believe this? There's only one thing that would make your brother believe something like that, and that is the resurrection. He was dead. We saw him dead on the cross. We saw that spear go into the side of Jesus. It hit his heart, and blood and water poured out of him. There's no like second guessing whether he was dead on that cross or not. A Roman centurion, a master executioner, stood there and pronounced Jesus dead. Do you get this today? They would understand he died. There's no way they're going to be fooled by like imposter Jesus shows up three days later, says, hey, I'm your brother. No, we know our brother. He's alive and he really is God. How about his mother? Think about this. She changed his diapers, right? Why in the world would you go with this story? I was talking to a mom this morning who was saying that the toddler in the house, the little one, was driving them just a little, you know, maybe cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, just to borrow that expression again. And I said, just listen for a minute, because I got something for you. There's a lot of moms out there today that might think their children are demon-possessed, but not that their children are the Son of God, right? Amen, moms? Is this true or false? Now, remember how I started this sermon. In Jesus' day, nobody believed in a personal resurrection. The Greeks didn't believe in it. The pagans didn't believe in it. The Jews didn't believe in it. No one believed in it. Mary changed Jesus' diapers. Why in the world would she go with this story if it's totally countercultural, the opposite of everything that everyone would ever want of their child, right? Why would she go with this? Because he really did rise from the grave. Mary bowed down and worshipped her son as God. Look, you can't convince any of your mothers or fathers to bow down on the ground and worship you as God. I promise you this. But she bowed before Jesus. He was her Savior, her Lord, and her God. 
Number three, we believe this because it was prophesied way before it even happened. I mean, a thousand years before Jesus died and rose again, David said in Psalm 1611, You will not abandon my soul in the grave in Sheol. You will not allow your Holy One, the Messiah, Jesus, to see corruption. He'll be in the grave, but he won't be abandoned in the grave. He will be in the grave, but his body will not corrupt. It won't have time to corrupt. Why is that, friends? Because he's going to rise one day. And then at 700 years before Jesus, the prophet Isaiah, which by the way, you go read Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, it's a big book, but basically you can reconstruct the entire four Gospels of Jesus. You find Jesus' birth, you find Jesus' miracles, you find Jesus' death, you find Jesus' resurrection, all in the book of Isaiah. Amazing. 700 years before he even came. And yet, Isaiah says in chapter 53 that the Messiah will make his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death. How did he know that 700 years earlier? I think God told him. He had done no violence. There was no deceit in his mouth, no sin. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him and put him to grief. He will see his offspring. He will prolong his days after death. Out of the anguish of his soul, he will see and be satisfied. Not many of us see our offspring after we die, do we? Uh, Death kind of ends that whole thing, right? Jesus sees his church built after he dies. Why? Because he's still the head of it. Number four, I would add as well, we should believe this because of the transformation of the disciples. Now think about this for a minute. The disciples of Jesus, his closest followers, were Jews. And if there's anything Jewish boys know, beat into them from little on up, it's the Ten Commandments. Let's think about the Ten Commandments. Exodus chapter 20. Commandment one, you should have no other gods before me. Commandment two, You should not make any graven images. Commandment three, you should not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Later on, you should not bear false witness. You should not lie. Now think about this. These guys were devout Jews who would be scared that if they broke the laws of God, if they worshipped a false God and violated him, violated the true God, All they would have to look forward to one day is the sentencing by God to the fires of eternal hell for violating the Ten Commandments. Besides the fact, these were men that after the death of Jesus, this would just violate their character that they were lying about this. I mean, these are guys who are feeding the poor. They care about widows and orphans. They call us to love our neighbor just like Jesus did as ourselves. They care for the needy and the hurting in the world. Why in the world would they endure this? If you're going to lie, you usually lie to benefit yourself, not to hurt yourself, right? And yet these guys endured the worst of the worst. They had boiling oil poured on them. They were crucified upside down. Only one of the disciples did not die, even though they tried to kill him one time, we're told, according to history. And then they exiled him on an island. Just think about the things they suffered for. You don't lie about something that doesn't benefit you. You lie when you do something wrong, right? To try to get out of it. You don't lie to get yourself in trouble with the world, which is exactly what they had happened because they followed Jesus as Lord. So my friends, there's no adequate explanation of all these things except for to say that Jesus is alive, Jesus rose from the grave, Jesus is Lord, Christ the Lord is risen today. So what do we do with the resurrection? What do we do? How do we respond to it? Here's how we end. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, if you believe in your heart that God is raised from the dead, you will be saved for with the mouth confession is made unto salvation, right? With the heart, you believe unto righteousness. So let's just talk about this just another minute and we're done. Last point here. We see two things mentioned here. Outward and inward responses to the resurrection and the lordship of Jesus. You see, the resurrection and the lordship of Christ is supposed to change you. If you call yourself a Christian, you are supposed to be radically changed by it. He says you need to, number one, confess. Now, confession and profession and believing in the heart, outwardly and inwardly, they're not two different things. They're two sides of one coin you've got to have today. They're the heads and tails together, okay? So think about this this way. Everyone in this room confesses something. To confess is to agree something, to, to profess something. Everybody agrees with something. So I start off by asking you, do you agree with what God has said about Jesus and what Jesus said about himself? I mean, 
when Jesus died on the cross, this should not have been a shock. He said over and over again, the Son of Man is going to die, and in three days he's going to rise again from the grave. Just like as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so I will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. He says, but I'm going to come again, and I'm going to receive you unto myself, right? Jesus promised his death and his resurrection. No surprise. So I ask you today, do you agree with what God said about Jesus and what Jesus said about himself? Do you agree with your mouth, with your words, what Jesus has said? This is good. This is a start. But then it needs to go deeper, right? In fact, I think Paul here basically is telling us, starting with what's observed, and then he moves backwards to the source, the cause of it. Secondly, you need to believe in your heart. It's got to go deeper than just your head and just your tongue. It's got to get down to your heart. In other words here, it's not just mental assent. It needs to change you mentally, Yes, but also emotionally, volitionally, your whole inward being. Were this not the case, we call that hypocrisy, right? If someone just talks about it but doesn't believe it, we call that hypocrisy. And we know hypocrites are about as popular as the IRS is on April 15th, right? And there's a lot of people, they show up in church and they talk and they sing, but it hasn't gotten here, that's hypocrisy, The profession of faith with your mouth, if there's no power in the heart, is mockery to God. Charles Spurgeon said, faith and confession are joined together. It's like a marriage. Let no man put them asunder. you got to say it, but you have to believe it from deep down inside of you. It's what's inside of you that matters. You will be saved if it's hitting your heart. David said, Lord, it's not a burnt offering and sacrifice you want. It is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Oh, God, you will not despise. God wants your heart. Then your words have some meaning to them. It's like the guy who knocks on your door and he says, hey, uh, and if if any of you are in the room, forgive me. You can yell at me later. He says, hey, I've got uh, some steaks that I'm selling. I've got three left in the truck. They're the best steaks I've sold the last three weeks. And they've got your name on them. I want to give you a good deal, right? And he's saying that, and he's got his fingers crossed behind his back because they're going to taste like shoe leather when you bite into them, right? You know what I'm talking about? It's not about what you say. It's about the meaning behind it. Now, if you believe under righteousness, you're saved. If your mouth confesses, you're saved. It's extremely trivial to say there's fire if you don't feel flame, if you don't see a flame, and if you don't feel heat, right? There's got to be something that has happened in you. The moment a sinner believes that Jesus loved them, that Jesus lived the life for them they could never live, that Jesus died the death and suffered the hell they deserve for eternity, when he really believes that with his heart, it's going to come out of his mouth. It's going to be all over his life. Everyone's going to see it and know it. And God the Father is going to take Jesus' perfect life and he's going to place it on your record and say, I don't see you anymore as a sinner. I don't see you anymore as guilty. I don't see you anymore is being used by the enemy, by the devil. I don't see you more anymore in this way. I see you as I see my own son Jesus, forgiven, alive, and I will never leave you nor forsake you. This is amazing. The whole Christian life becomes a life of confession because Jesus has changed you. Confession is not a condition of salvation. It is the inevitable of what happens outwardly when what inside your life has been changed forever. I want to close with a story from church history, the second century, not too long after Jesus, about 100 years later. There's a man who is a bishop. He's a pastor of the church of Smyrna, and his name is Polycarp. We are told in history that Polycarp was a disciple of the Apostle John. And as an old man, he was a leader of the church there in Asia Minor, present-day Turkey. Some of you have been there before. And as he's leading the church, persecution breaks out against the Christians. Horrible persecution. Believers were being fed to the wild beasts in the arenas. The crowds began to call for the Christians' leader, Polycarp. He was well known in the area because of his influence for the gospel. The authorities sent out a search party for Polycarp to bring him in. In fact, they had to torture two slave boys to reveal just where Polycarp was staying that day. It was a Friday afternoon. He was an old man resting in his country home. We are told that it was a fully armed guard that busted into his house as if they were coming to arrest a dangerous criminal. 
Polycarp's friends wanted him to sneak out as they saw them coming. But he refused, saying, God's will will be done, because he was not ashamed. You see, his words didn't just say it, his heart believed it. And so Polycarp welcomed this armed escort as if they were his friends. He talked with them. He ordered them food and drink to be served by those who were taking care of him. And then he had one request that he could pray for one hour before they took him away. Well, as he prayed, which actually went for two hours according to history, these guys that were coming to arrest him started to have second thoughts about this, but they had to follow orders. So they take him back. The, the crowds are screaming for his death. Because he's a Christian. He's a Christ follower. And the authorities are starting to sense that this is senseless. This is an old man. Why should we kill him? So they start to try to reason with him. Polycarp, what's the big deal? Just say Caesar is Lord and save yourself. Polycarp refused. They brought Polycarp into the arena. And they said, curse Christ and we will release you today and you will not die. His reply was these words, 86 years, I have served him and he has never done me wrong. How can I blaspheme my king who has saved me? The proconsul reached for an acceptable way to get out of this. They really didn't want to kill this guy. Then just do this, old man, just swear by the spirit of the emperor and that will be sufficient. Just swear by his spirit instead of swearing an oath by the hand of God. His reply, if you imagine for a moment that I would do that, then I think you pretend that you don't know who I am. Hear it plainly. I am a Christian. More entreaties, more pleading. Polycarp stood firm. They threatened him with the wild beast to ravage him and destroy, rip his body to shreds in front of this momentous crowd. This was his reply. Bring them forth. I would change my mind if it meant going from the worst to the better, but not to change from the right to the wrong. The proconsul's patience was over. They were not going to be made a fool of. I will have you burned alive. Polycarp said, you threaten fire that burns for an hour and is over, but the judgment on the ungodly is forever. The fire was prepared. He was tied up. He lifted up his eyes to heaven and he prayed, Father, I bless you that you have deemed me worthy on this day and hour that I may take a portion of the martyrs in the cup of Christ. Among these, may I today be welcome before thy face as a rich and acceptable sacrifice. And then to finish him off, they stabbed him with a dagger as he was burning to death. He accepted martyrdom rather than retract his confession and the belief that had changed his heart that Jesus was alive and that Jesus was Lord. My friends, that is true faith. It changes everything. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. If you believe in me, though you were dead, yet you will live. Polycarp had nothing to fear because he was just going to something so much better. I say to you today, Jesus is alive. He says, come to me, come to me, turn from your sins and come to me and I will give you rest. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. The burdens, the guilts, the sins, the judgment you deserve was taken on Christ at the cross and God accepted it with the resurrection. Today, if you call out to him, you will be forgiven. You will be saved and you will rise one day with him. Would you join me in prayer, please? Bow your heads and your hearts. Oh Lord, we come before you this day. We come before you knowing that you are the savior that you are the one who changes everything by the cross, that you are alive. You are in this place right now. You are seeking to save and change people forever. Oh God, I pray that today, right now, people would confess you. People would believe on you as Savior and Lord, that their sins would be removed, that their lives would be changed. I just ask you, congregation, right now, as we're bowing in prayer, if you don't know Christ, pray to him. Confess your sins your faithlessness, confess your failures, but trust that Jesus is alive and he will rescue you. He will save you right now. Oh Lord, I'm a sinner, but I trust that Jesus will save me. I believe, forgive me and change me. Oh God, accept the prayers of those who have trusted in you. We believe we will rise one day. And today you have given them new life. And we celebrate saving souls in this place. So we give you praise for this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen.
friend, this is Joshua Walnofer, pastor of Klondike Baptist, and I want to thank you for taking the time to listen to this sermon today. If we can be of any help to you, answer any questions about the Bible, or talk more with you about the salvation provided by the mighty hand of Christ Jesus, feel free to contact us by any of the methods mentioned on our church website. If you would like to share a testimony of how God's Word has transformed your life, please write and let us know. We'd love to hear from you. And remember, Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone pluck them out of my hand.